Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's episode of Lest We Forget. Our guest today is a 1990 graduate who has been a singer and an actor on stage and screen, a professional illusionist, released two solo CDs, and authored several books. In case those avenues of work weren't enough, he is also a certified speaker, trainer, and coach with the John Maxwell team, as well as an advanced certified human behavior consultant with Personality Insights. His speaking engagements have found him sharing a stage with speakers like Rudy Giuliani, Colin Powell, Mike Huckabee, and Dr. John C. Maxwell, to name a few. Please welcome my guest, Ken Hartley. Ken, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to make this happen with us. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, Caitlin, it's great to be here. Uh, love, love Union University. We have uh, literally my entire life at that place uh, before I was in college. So I think the world of the institution and I'm glad to be associated with it. That's so wonderful to hear. We love having multiple generations of unionites throughout the family. Um, so that's always fun. One of my first questions that I always like to ask our guests is um, to talk a little bit about their time from the academic perspective, whether you had a favorite class or professor that you really enjoyed during your time here. Well, you know, people who know Union are going to get me if I don't say my father. So got to put Dr. Hartley in there for sure as one of the favorites, although having him for a class was not fun because he would write things on my test like nice try next time study, you know, because you're not going to fool your dad. Uh, so that was, that was a different thing, but yeah, I had some favorite teachers while I was there. Uh, one of them that really sticks out for me was Warren Spahn in biology. And I'm did not like, uh, I, I wasn't a big science person, but took his class and he made he didn't teach a class. He kind of preached the class and really made it a lot of fun. And he was so animated and he, he was a great speaker all the way around. Uh, he stuck out for me. Uh, another speaker, Terry Lindley, who was in the history department, was another one who really anim very animated and just made you want to learn more. Uh, Don Richards in the math department, just a great godly man. And one of two people in my life that really helped me understand mathematics, in particular advanced algebra, uh, went over and beyond. But I think the one that sticks out that had the most impact, and it was from one class, and that was in music, and that was Dr. McClune uh, from sight singing and ear training class. And music was something I was made to do from a very young age. And there was a concept in the class that one of the students was not getting. And he was going over and beyond to help the student do it. And at one point, I, I kind of rolled my eyes and he saw it out of the corner of his eye. And he went, all right, Hartley. And then asked me a question, which I immediately answered because it came easy for me. He asked me another one and I fired another answer back just really quickly and kind of, you know, and he stopped the class. And he looked at me and he said, Hartley, I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather have a C student trying as hard as they can than an A student who's just playing games any day of the week. And mm -hmm. nailed me to the wall. I deserved every bit of it. And that particular comment helped change my life. I love that. Yes, it's so... I think so many times, especially, you know, for students, we think that success is measured by their grades, but also looking at your time in college is so much more to that professor's lesson of who, who, what's the, who is the man you're going to become? Not necessarily just the, who is the student in my classroom at this time. And um, I love that that's what college can do for us is it can create more than just an academic student, but a well-rounded individual. Especially when you have teachers that care more about your your well being, uh, and your overall, who, they they care more about who you're becoming than the grades you're getting, and that yeah. was evident all the way through Union. Yes, absolutely. Well, what about your time outside of the classroom? You know, when your dad wasn't, you know, picking on you in the classroom. Um, what about that social aspect of college life? Is there a fun or funny memory or just like a special memory that sticks out to you? You know, I, 
it, college, I, I spent college trying too hard from the first part of it, because even in the social aspects, I was still, I wasn't really Ken Hartley. Well, my dad was Dr. Ken Hartley. I was, I was either Kenny or I was Doc's son. That's how I was known around there. And you couldn't really escape from that because dad cast and rightfully so a very long shadow. Uh, I was involved in some social things. I was in a fraternity. I was an SAE there. And, uh, but again, the, the whole trying too hard aspect adds a whole new layer and causes you to grow up rather quickly uh, from, <laughs> from the well-deserved, uh, not physical, nor not, but just the verbal assaults that you get from other people. You, you kind of deserved all of that. So that social aspect was uh, was a difficult growing up time for me. But again, it really, in the long run, really helped me a lot. And then I also was in the Baptist Student Union and found a lot of good friends to connect with there. And some of them I'm still good friends with to this day. You kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I always like to hear from um, those that I'm interviewing is how do you see the time that you spent here at Union impacting your life now? So many times we feel like college can be such a capsule of a moment, um, but when we look back, we can see that so many of those lessons we've built upon as we have aged. Yeah, I again, the teachers were a big part of that who talked past a classroom and in, into your life. That had a huge impact. But then I think about the lives that they were living. Uh, another one, uh, David Burke, who I went through theater class with, who taught me everything I know about acting. And, it, I, and in that class, uh, I mean, I've just done a couple of little parts in some movies, but then you have a guy who was, we roomed together, Kirby Atkins, who you know, is producing these major motion pictures with stars. And uh, that was David Burke's influence because he wasn't just interested in you graduating from college and succeeding in college. He wanted you to succeed in life and pouring those lessons into a person really can have a lasting impact. I think the biggest event that had the most impact on me in college would have to be in 1987. And there was a revival at the school, a guy came in to speak. His name is Kelly Green. And I still, years later, I get to travel with Kelly Green. He's an evangelist. And he stood up for a chapel service. And there was a, goodness. Oh, I know what it was. It was uh, the Baptist Student Union. And they did this dance drama thing to Carmen's The Champion, which we look back now and go, oh my goodness, it's so cheesy. But back then it was the coolest thing ever. And uh, God just kind of settled in the place and we all knew it. And Kelly Green got up and said, I had a message to preach. It's a pretty good message, but God's told me I'm not to preach it. Some of you need to get right. Some of you need to get saved. You know who you are. Let's go. And that was it. And we were in there for eight and a half hours. They canceled classes. It was, and it, which tells volumes about the faculty at Union and what they care about. But we saw people get saved. We saw people get right. And that's really where God confirmed a call in my life to ministry. So I would have to say that revival in the fall of 1987 was probably the most transformative thing that happened to me during my Union years. Wow. What a amazing experience as well. You know, we've recently there Asbury had, you know, a similar mm -hmm. experience and how many students have come out of that. And just the, to have that kind of a moment, like you said, it crosses all the boundaries of, you know, we're talking about who you are as a student, who you are spiritually, where the Lord's calling you. And just to get to experience that is, that's pretty unique and amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up in a few weeks. Uh, we go to a worship conference in Orlando called the Experience Conference. But while we're there, there's there'll be about four thousand, not say four, about three thousand people that'll be at this conference. But there's a group of union people that will get together, and we always have dinner together while we're at this event, and we always talk about things. And inevitably, the discussion of that revival at that place and the difference it made in our lives, and the people that are still in ministry thirty years later, as a result of what God did, and that is pretty awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. I love that yeah. story. Um, so as I mentioned in your bio, you are 
continuing to help people to learn how to be better equipped as leaders where they are, um, wherever the Lord has called them and place them. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, is there a specific aspect of leadership that you maybe feel is most lacking in our current uh, climate in the business world or nonprofits? Just this thing that you keep seeing over and over again um, that isn't necessarily there in our current leadership. Absolutely. It would be the realization that true leadership has absolutely nothing to do with you and everything to do with the people that you're serving. And that's what leadership is. Uh, we know in the kingdom of God, and I teach in corporations, I'm teaching, teaching this in secular organizations and they get it. They really understand this concept that leadership is about serving the people that you're working with and empowering them to achieve great things, not about you holding a position and going, oh, now I've got these initials in front of my name or behind my name. Look at me. Because people are only interested in leadership in as much as it benefits them. And as leaders, the fruit of a leader is not a follower. The fruit of a leader is another leader. And so that's what we ought to be producing in the people, empowering them to achieve their goals, to do great things, to accomplish great things, and in turn, produce more leaders. And that's what's lacking. I see I see it politically. I see it business-wise. I see it in churches all across the board is that somebody holds a position and they think somehow that position entitles them to something when in fact, the position of savior entitled him to wash everybody's feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we can get a hold of that, it'll change leadership everywhere. Yes. You're so true. And like you said, it is this model of replicating more leaders instead of standing back as leaders and saying, where we're, where, where are all of the next generation of leaders? We're called to be the ones that are doing that to create that. What about for those that are maybe in a position where we can recognize that leadership can occur in any position. You do not have to have, like you said, the title of leader to be a leader. Um, but how can we also be better followers, whether that's in our own community or in our own job or church, um, in our own homes even? What are some of those elements um, of that servant leadership that also make us better followers? That's a great question, Kaylin. I would say the greatest thing that a person can recognize is the definition of what leadership is. It's not a position. It's not a title. It's not being able to exercise control over somebody. That's the least of what leadership is. It was J. Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Leadership, which is, if you've never read that book, that is the best book on leadership I've ever read, bar none. It's only about that thick. And it's one of those books where you read a couple pages and then you have to go over into a corner and repent for a while and then come back to it. But it was J. Oswald Sanders who said, leadership is influence. The ability of one person to influence someone else to follow his or her lead. That is the essence of leadership. It's influence. And regardless of where you are in the company, top, middle, or at the bottom of the company, you have influence. You have influence. So the fact that you can influence somebody else and realize too, influence is morally neutral. It can be positive. It can be negative. And that's really your choice as to how you're going to influence others. So you're going to make them better. So before you can be in authority, you have to really be under authority and learn to do that well, because you're not going to understand what the people are going through until you've walked through that road yourself, which when I see people that are thrust into a leadership position early, which let me say, that happened to me. I started leading in a church when I was 18 years old, and it was a position that dad called and said, hey, just do this. And I was leading people between the ages of 22 to 86 in that first time. And they were all going, oh, you're so young. Oh, you're so young. You're such a baby. You're such a baby. And I was. And I knew nothing about leadership, which, by the way, is funny, too, because I was too young, too young, too young. And then all of a sudden, I was too old. And nobody ever told me when I was just right. I just want to put that out there. Okay. <laughs> It's so I'm true. Too, that happens all the time. You're too young. Now you're too old. Too old. <laughs> when did it happen? Yeah. Right. But I didn't understand that what leadership was. And I thought, well, I can't tell somebody something that's that much older. How do I tell somebody that's that much older than me this? 
But the truth of the matter is if I'm influencing and I really feel like I'm doing something that is in their best interest. In other words, if I saw somebody running headlong off of a cliff and I saw them running and they didn't see the end, but I did, what kind of terrible person would I have to be to let them run off that and not say anything? Well, if I feel like I'm helping and influencing people, I mean, I'm really trying to help them avoid something bad or embrace something good, then whatever position I'm in, wherever I am in the company, whatever age I am, it doesn't matter because I'm doing it from a heart of serving and helping. And that makes all the difference. Yes, I love that. And I love it as well, because it is something that we can all do. It's not saying, you know, you have to have this specific quality or you have to have this trait, but it is just coming back to saying, I'm here to serve. I'm here to have the best interest in heart for everyone. And that is something that we're all capable of, that it doesn't matter how you're wired or how the Lord made you, or like you said, where you fall in line when it comes to the authority um, that we can all lead with that heart of service. Mm -hmm. You are clearly passionate about what you, what you teach and what you instruct. Mm -hmm. Um, What's your favorite, maybe exercise or topic that you get to work with people when you do go to these conferences and you're doing this training, you, you work on this and that just gives you so much energy and joy. What, what are some of those things? Uh, You touched on one of them a second ago, which I'll get back to it about being wired a certain way. That's, that's a big one. But the latest things that I've been teaching last, last week, I was, uh, I did a keynote address for the American hospital association where I talked to them about leadership illusions, which is based on a book. I wrote 21 things people believe about leadership that are not true. And so I go through the myths. I use some illusions. That's my hobby is I'm an illusionist. And I, I do that to illustrate the points, to help them remember it. And then say, embrace the reality, not the illusion, and you'll do fine. I do another one called leading yourself, how to overcome when you're overwhelmed. That's a big one for a lot of people because they're walking in burnout and stress. And it's because they're not properly leading themselves and not taking care of themselves. That's a big one. But the wired one is the I think that's the one I'm the most passionate about. And I just wrote a book on it actually called God Wired. And just because people are talking to each other does not mean they're communicating. In fact, 90% of all human communication is nonverbal. So people are talking at each other, but you see the situation all the time, corporations, churches, everywhere. It's universal where somebody will say, I told you that. And they look and go, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, I did. No, you didn't. And here's the truth. I'm convinced both people are right. I'm convinced they really did say it. And I'm convinced the other person really didn't hear it. And so when I go to other countries and I'm speaking, the one thing I can do in another country is I can order a bottle of water in about eight different languages. It is purely survival because water is all I drink. But if I look at you and I say, uh, it's not going to mean anything to you, but For somebody in Israel that speaks Hebrew, I very clearly said to them, may I please have a bottle of water? They'll understand me clearly in Hebrew. But it doesn't help with you if I slow it down and go, if I could say it louder, slower, it doesn't matter. This happens all the time in corporations and in churches where they're saying things loudly, slowly, but they're not speaking the same temperamental language. And they have to understand what each person wants. Some people want to win. They want to get this job done. Some people want to have fun and connect with others. Some people just want peace on their borders and other people want it done, but they want it done the right way. And depending on what each person wants, the temperamental languages are desperately different, but that's the way that God wired us. There's no right. There's no wrong with it because when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, mind, strength. Heart is the I personality. Soul is that S personality that that gives peace. Mind is that C personality that's clarity, that's cautious. And then strength is that D personality. And Jesus said, if you're going to love like you're supposed to, love the Lord your God with all those things. But then he said, love your neighbor as yourself, which means you have to adapt those personality styles for the personality of the person you're talking to. That's yeah. the thing I'm probably the most passionate about because I love the moments where I see people go, oh, all of a sudden they understand that coworker they didn't get along with. Or I've even seen them go, that spouse, 
finally, I get my spouse. I get where they're coming from. And one of the most powerful statements in this is, and it's an old one, is we judge ourselves by our intent. We judge others by their actions, which means they show up late. They're constantly late. They're constantly doing this stuff. But we show up late. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I had a phone call or, you know, this was a flat tire or something happened. But we don't show that same benefit to other people. But if we'll judge them, judge them, not by their actions, but give them the benefit of intent, that there really are, maybe they meant well, then it helps us connect with them in a powerful way. And uh, Jesus modeled that. And the greatest example of it is the woman caught in adultery, where the Pharisees throw her in front of Jesus. And the deep personality in Jesus stands those Pharisees straight up and goes, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. It's a confrontational thing to say. They drop their stones and leave. And he looks and the I personality connects with this woman and says, you, he said, woman, woman, where are your accusers? Now saying woman in our day would be derogatory, but in his day, saying woman made her an equal. It was huge for him to speak to her. She looked around and said, they're gone. And the S personality said, hey, neither do I condemn you. But the C personality didn't excuse one bit of it. He said, go and sin no more. And Jesus moved effortlessly through all of them. So that's the essence of God wired. And that's the thing probably the most passionate about teaching. Because when people connect, unity happens and God does great things. Yes. And I would imagine for you, that's such a great tool. Um, even when you're speaking with an organization that these people aren't coming from a religious background, but what a great way to talk about and begin to lay in those elements of loving another as yourself to see that you're unique and different, not because it happened, but because God made you that way. And so just how that is so applicable in any situation that you're in, being able to have those kinds of conversations open so many more doors beyond just the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, it's so much fun when they have the aha moments. That's, I, I live for those, uh, to see that and to see it make a difference in their lives. And, you know, corporately, when they call me back and say, our production is really going through the roof because we were able to well, they will realize sometimes they may, it's Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, said they may be in the on the right bus, but they're in the wrong seat. And we realized when we understood their particular personality, why do we have the fun person in a room by themselves counting a bunch of numbers? Why don't we have them out front, you know, doing this? And they slide people around and all of a sudden everything just happens. It's it's always rewarding. Yes. That's so neat. I love that. I love those kinds of assessments myself. So I'm always yeah. geeking out about that kind of thing. Um, well, I just want to thank you so much for spending some time with us, um, for making this happen. I'm so yeah. grateful for that. And um, I can't wait for our viewers to see this episode. And to our viewers, I hope that you will stick around and join us next month for another episode of Lest We Forget.